So, hello again. I'd like to thank again once more the organizers, the volunteers, and the technical staff. Uh, a really, truly amazing conference. Um, so there's, uh, I know there's a thin line between a disclaimer and disavowal, but I would like to point out, based on the promos that went out about the conference, that I am certainly not a type guru. I never have been, I never will be. Uh, I'm rather more an interloper, if you like. Um, but I'm, I've felt very welcome, and I'm very glad to be here. Um, and I'm glad you're all still around and you haven't left for dinner yet. Uh, so there was a talk a little bit earlier about uh, a panel presentation about job titles. Uh, here's one for you. Um, I'm on my third career right now. So my first career was uh, uh, I, I fucked up my A-levels in England, and I ended up having to live at home and go to the local polytechnic and do a degree in house building, which was a miserable experience. I don't recommend it to anybody. I then went to London and went to art school and then became an art director designer um, in advertising and design for about four and a half years. Decided I really didn't like that either. And I did what any self-respecting disillusioned Brit would do. I, I escaped to Vancouver and uh, volunteered for Greenpeace and Adbusters for a while, grew a ponytail briefly, um, and then walked backwards into grad school. I found the only way to uh, remain uh, in Canada was to become a student. So I dutifully enrolled, uh, enrolled in a university, did three years, uh, a two-year MA at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, and then uh, took my partner uh, to uh, Massachusetts to do a PhD. And in 2002, 2003, I came up to Montreal uh, to uh, apply for, to do a job talk for a job at Concordia University for something called, here's the job title, Digital Multimedia Production. They hired me, darn fools. I still don't know what digital multimedia production is, but I snuck in. Uh, we renamed that area of production in our department, Intermedia. And uh, six years later, I was thoroughly exhausted by having to teach everything new that came out every year in terms of what the students understood to be digital media or new media, and decided I needed some respite. So I did what anybody would do. I enrolled in a week-long uh, Bolex hand uh, processing and printing workshop in rural Ontario called The Film Farm. I thoroughly recommend it to anybody. And uh, we would wind up the Bolexes in the morning. We would go out and shoot in the fields. We would then come back into the cow sheds and turn on the red light, put the goggles on, and hand process the film, wash it with a garden hose, put it out on the washing line. When it was dry, we would then take it upstairs and then hand tint and tone, edit it together on wobbly old steam backs, and then project it in the basement twice during the week, um, which was a wonderful experience. So this is me at a table at the film farm. So I had an epiphany while I was working there. I was delving into the bins. Imagine this, our students often don't understand. Real bins full of dusty old film, not final cut or premiere metaphors. And I was working with found footage, and I decided I was going to weave the film together that I was pulling out. So I would cut along frame lines. I would cut other pieces into kind of shoelaces, weave it all together. And then I made an exceedingly short film. Um, a friend of mine called Jackie Gallant wrote some music for it, and I'm going to show it to you right now. And uh, here we go. No, here we don't go. How do I get? No. Anybody know how to get a video to play when you're in presenter mode? Spacebar, maybe? Yes. Sound, please. That was it. Weaving takes a long time, it turns out. So that was the beginning of my ongoing fascination with film leaders, what I pulled out of that bin on that day at the film farm, the peculiar and particular artifacts I've come to understand as the metadata of the physical medium of film as film. They're generally utilitarian. They're occasionally artful. So this is a story about old media, residual media, analog media, its materiality, 
media archaeology, the metadata of an analog medium, the ephemerality of certain techniques and protocols associated with the processing, printing, distribution, projection, and the potential preservation of film as uh, film. As film. Excuse me. Okay. So like design and typography, leaders are paratextual, routinely considered to be outside of the actual text that constitutes the film. In other words, the thing that directors direct, editors edit, audiences watch, Netflix streams, Rotten Tomatoes scores, and critics critique. Further, they're part of what I'm calling the producerly paratext. Unlike consumerly items such as posters, tickets, DVD covers, etc., leaders are like test charts and timing cards, part of a hidden domain of film-related labor. Until the recent widespread adoption of digital protection technologies in the US and Canada, movies were always physical things. Narrow strips of nitrate, acetate, or polyester, sometimes miles long, cut into more manageable sections, wound onto reels and distributed by studios to film exchanges and theaters inside protective canisters or cases. With physical film prints, mutilation while in circulation was a very common problem, especially in the early days of popular cinema. Here's an article from 19... 26 in a trade journal. Film exchangers and theater projectionists blamed each other for the most egregious damage, including excessive dirt, tears, scratches, damaged sprocket holes, missing scenes, added markings, punched holes, and even the use of pins or wire to fix breaks. Only as this emergent booming industry began to mature and the cost of such damage was fully realized, did new professional associations such as AMPAS, or the Academy as we know it now, or SIMPTI, the Society for Motion Picture and Television, latterly engineers, develop and impose meaningful standards for the handling and care of films in general circulation. By 1930, leaders were already part of the lexicon of film printing, duplication, distribution, and projection, but were still being officially defined as blank. Archival evidence strongly suggests that they were often anything but blank, as this example shows, even pre-standardization, since an area already attached to the film content provided an ideal space for identification, statements of ownership, and instruction. The arrival of, a, of sound films presented an additional challenge, the synchronization of separate picture and audio sources. And as we'll see, this was solved by the use of special timing marks, countdowns on the area of the film reel immediately before the first frame of the movie proper. But I'm getting ahead of myself. After the film farm, I grabbed leaders wherever I could find them, eBay, and allowed myself the luxury of a sustained period of play as a way to think about and through leaders. So here we are with some photo montage. I did some stained glass, some light painting, some 3D modeling, some interactive works and video microscopy, and some handwriting, and some weaving. So back to those countdowns. It turns out that there have been four de facto US standards since 1930 each sufficiently distinctive in terms of design to be easily distinguishable, although often referred to collectively, generically, as academy leader. I'll stick with the first three, which are the most ubiquitous and most closely associated with analog, i.e. film as film. So this is the interactive part. You now get to do the pose if you have one of the pieces of film. The, the cheesy, cliche pose of the filmmaker with their film. You know, the photographer does this. The filmmaker sits with the film. So if you hold it up to the light, you have in your hands, if you have a strip of film, one of the th first three standards, so you can compare and contrast, and then I'll test you at the end, but not really. Okay, so here we go. This, this is the Academy Leader from 1930. This is partly simulated. There's no sound with this. We start from 11. They're upside down. There we go. It's almost over. It's done. OK, next up, my favorite, the Society Leader from 1951. This was an accommodation to the needs of television. It was a design departure, as you'll see in a moment. Now, whereas over 85% of the frames in the Academy Leader, the one we've just seen, are actually completely blank, every single frame in the Society Countdown incorporates one graphical element or another, including the innovative addition of a fixed-density gray background. Um, the aesthetics insp inspiration, I don't know. This is 1951, post-war period. 
I wonder whether the designers had in mind um, gun or bomb sites, perhaps, or camera sites. So here we go with the society leader. Okay, last of the three that we're looking at today, the universal leader. If any of the successive leader designs since 1930 can be said to be ubiquitous, it is this one. In graphical terms, it represents another major departure from existing practice, deploying a design aesthetic far removed from the academy and the society leaders preceding it, and also fully animated this time. I don't know what the design inspiration was. We can often never know what people had in mind. But uh, it's usually described by archivists and film projectionists as a clock sweep, as you'll see in a moment. But I'm guessing that the classic PPI, or plan position indicator radar screen, might also have been an influence. Here we go. There was a Led Zeppelin joke earlier on about 666. Um, I found that looking at these leaders, the sixes are often a huge clue as to which leader standard we're looking at. Remember that if you go into any archive, you can find a jumble of all these different kinds of leaders. Um, you'll see that the academy is at the top there, 11 through 3. Uh, this is numbered per 16 frames. Uh, the society is 11 through 3, numbered per 16 frames, right way up this time. Um, instead of having a six written and a nine written and also in figures, we've now just got it in uh, words. The universal is 1965, eight through two. We've lost the nine, so there's going to be no confusion between the six and the nine in the projection booth. And now we're running at 24 frames. So instead of a foot of film, we're dealing with a second of film. Okay, so... At some point during the project, since I started in about 2011, um, after the film farm, um, I've had the honor and the privilege of visiting several serious archives. This is the Library of Congress um, nitrate archives. This is the collection of nitrate film in the Library of Con Congress in Culpeper, rural Culpeper, Virginia. It feels a little bit like Teletubbies, if you've ever seen that, sort of rolling hills, a little bit surreal. Um, it's the Packard campus. The Packard family donated the money. And this was formerly where they uh, stored massive amounts of currency so that if it was a nuclear apocalypse, they could restart the banks with the money hidden under the hills there. And it's been repurposed. So this is me in this particular film archive. Now, imagine calling up an archive to say you want to look at some leaders. It's kind of like asking a librarian for some interesting colophons. Any colophons will do. I just want to look at some. I usually have to begin with the catalog, so, I am, so am I to look up famous or obscure films, specific studios, genres, time periods? Fortunately, the more I've looked, the easier these questions become, as I hope will become clear to you, too. It is, of course, the height or depth of perversity, to have once-in-a-lifetime unfettered access to priceless prints of All Quiet on the Western Front, Citizen Kane, Bringing Up Baby, Top Hat, and His Girl Friday, examining the first 20 feet of a reel of nitrate, and then skipping right by the film content itself to ogle the last 12 feet of the reel, except, of course, that leaders are content. So the standards... That, we, uh, that I've been talking about are always authoritative. They have an air of authority about them, but they're also aspirational. The actual evidence on the ground in the archives may be rather different. This is just one example of somebody somewhere along the line in the distribution or preservation of this print decided to draw in wax pencil a top hat on a print of top hat. Okay, so what else did I find? Well, here's one. These figures are collectively known, rather dubiously, as China girls, and feminist scholars such as Marianne Doan, Genevieve uh, Yeu, and Lorna Roth have rightly interrogated the dubious racial and gender codes of the test frames known variously as China girls, Shirley, Lily, or Lady Wedge. These often turn up tucked into the identification sections of head and tail leaders. Now, different eras of leader standard designs are jumbled in and, often, and as often discarded or switched out or routinely detached and reattached during their lifetimes. There are some amazing things to be found on leaders when we start collecting them together. There is handwriting, utilitarian handwriting. This is not hand lettering, of course. Even on single frames, these are quotidian markings. There is uh, all kinds of evidence and patterns that start to develop and you start to notice. And this is one of my favorites. There's evidence of people 
This is Gone with the Wind from 1939. This is a Technicolor test pattern from a leader from a print. Can you see the hand over on the left-hand side? I love it. Love it. So let's look at some actual countdowns from out there in the field, which I collect avidly. Um, the Library and Archives Canada has a collection of Norman McLaren's work. You may know him as an animator um, from the National Film Board. This is a print, we think, a partial print of Begone Dull Care, one of his very famous animations. And here is some hand-painted uh, countdown, um, possibly, potentially, McLaren's own hand, I think is intriguing. A couple of other ones. I've got to thank George Willimon uh, from the Library of, of Congress, who's the, the chief nitrate archivist for this particular one. We think, perhaps, this is from Xerox Films. And it's based on the universal clock sweep leader. And here's another one. This was a recent discovery. Thank you, and, and thanks to uh, Margaret Compton. Um, in Athens, Georgia. Here we go. And you might have surmised that that is based on the society leader. You can see echoes of the design principles there too. So how is, um, how is it that we recognize this stuff? Some of you may never have actually handled film before. Some of you may not have friends or family who are projectionists. It seems like this stuff kind of looks familiar. So there's a question there for me that I've been exploring too. And it turns out the more you look for them, the more you realize leaders are everywhere. They've been examined in experimental film, in an avant-garde film, if you like. They've been deployed in documentaries. They've been misused in movies and routinely mangled in music videos and graphic design. So here are some examples. Uh, Bruce Connor was uh, an experimental filmmaker who used leader a lot. There are some questions there, some open questions about why he might, why experimental filmmakers might delve into those bins. Uh, the economy, I would think, is something. The reflexivity and the gesture of using formerly used film as found footage. This is actually a film poster of his uh, from 1965, which actually lays out a lot of leader. You can see some society in there. And I think there's a smidgen of universal in there somewhere. Documentaries. Here's an example. Going Clear, the documentary, Alex Gibney's documentary about Scientology. Now, this gets the golden prize, the hat trick, because it uses, in the first half hour of the film, uh, the editor, Gibney, uses a few fleeting frames of Countdown Leader from all three standards that I'm talking about today as a transitional device, a stylistic flourish, perhaps, to signal a change in register from, for example, talking heads to archival film footage. So it's doing work in this context, and we don't sit up and leap out of off the sofa when we see it. It, it makes sense to us implicitly somehow. Let's look elsewhere for it. Persona, uh, Bergman's film Persona, Naughtiness going on at the beginning of the film, and uh, we see a projector, we see the projection of film leader and a playful um, relationship to this academy leader countdown. Here's another one, Cinema Paradiso, a reflexive moment when the main character at the, towards the end of the film, it's a bit of a plot spoiler, I'm afraid if you haven't seen it, towards the end of the film actually sits down to look at a compilation of cut up film, and here we see a film leader there too. Here's another one. This is a good one. So this is the artist from 2011. In a scene where the main character has sound film demonstrated to him, he thinks it's the most funny, hilarious thing he's ever seen and doesn't take it seriously at all. He sits in the booth with the, uh, John Goodman, who's playing the producer, the studio executive, to look at a, a bit of sound film. And we see some film. So the, the scene is in 1929, and we're seeing some leader from 1951, because this is a society leader. So a bit of a cock up there. Uh, I said that uh, music videos mangled film leader. Here we go with some REM, Fall On Me, wonderful piece of music. Society leader kind of mangled in there with the, uh, the action in the music video. And if you've gone back on YouTube to look at old music videos, I find them universally, hopelessly pretentious. But there you go. That's just me personally. Oh, well. And in a lot of cases, the people who were making those music videos clearly went to film school with, and, and learned from the work of people like Bruce Connor, which I think is interesting. Bruce Connor has often been referred to as the, the grandfather of music video. 
Here's um, Canada's finest, tragically hip, an early video for Blow at Haido, 1989. And again, here's some society leader. And even a little clue over here, which I've never seen anywhere else, there's one frame of it in this music video, is a clue to the fact that they did a second issue in 1953 of the society leader after making some very, very minor changes. Yes, it gets that geeky. OK, and I said that designers sometimes mangle them. This is about the, the, the least offensive in terms of design. Maybe the bank soundtracks one. Um, and so this is Universal, of course. This is Universal. That's a reference, if you like, to Universal. We'll be kind to that one. And then here we've got, I don't know what, so a bit of Universal over there, a reference to Universal, um, kind of. Uh, Kodak sort of playing, but they have a one. You never get a one in a film leader, as far as I know. And then it gets worse. So here we have. Uh, 543, you would never see that, of course, because there's going to be, in, with the universal leader, there's going to be 24 frames uh, between each transition from one number to the next. There's sort of something going on there, and then I don't know what's going on over there, really, how much at all. Okay, so, uh, of course, there are other standards internationally, although there are some resonances in terms of those US standards. Uh, that's something I'd love to explore. And there were some competing domestic standards, or at least traces of, whispers of, um, in the archives and in the patent records, which is always an awesome place to look. So, the project is called Lost Leaders. And why are they lost? Well, I've tried to show just now that this is a process of discovery and experimentation and interpretation and some scholarship, too. And that leaders are lost in several ways. They're usually invisible. They're routinely invisible. Film leaders are disappearing physically because archives are not being kept. Film leaders have been routinely neglected. Um, I, I contacted one small archive in Western Canada, mentioning no names, and said I'd like to drop in, because I was on the way through, and I was interested in looking at film leaders. And they sent me a polite email back and said, well, actually, you're just out of time, because we've just been through our entire archive, and cut away all the leaders, and thrown them away, and put new leaders on everything. Of course, if I'd had my moment, I would have said, well, could you not attach more leaders to the old leaders? That would have been wonderful. I'm also lost in process. It's still very much a, uh, an enjoyment of the process of being lost and playing with the material that I'm finding. So the bottom line here is that leaders are content, as Michael Hinton at the Library of Congress has said many times. And I think we should be saving them as best we can. So the for, there's a forensic speculation that I want to talk about here, too, um, is that um, in the 30s, each studio's art department, I think, must have drafted its own academy leader. So we'll go back to this first one, right? The society and universal leaders would, were printed, designed, drawn up, and printed and distributed by Simti. Uh, the academy leader was not. There was, a, there was a, 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 as far as I understand, there was a, a published uh, standard. And then the studios were left to their own devices to interpret that themselves. So. I have a sense right now that each studio's art department drafted its own academy leader masters based on the published guidelines, in which case, ooh, in which case it might be feasible to identify the source of a specific version of the academy leader based on the way the numbers and letters were drawn and then degraded over time. So here's what I kind of mean by that. This is a, an academy leader from Arsenic and Old Lace from Warner. Something slightly different going on here. This is The Killing of Sister George, a print with an Academy leader on it, which I think is contemporary. His Girl Friday with Columbia. I'm just starting on this work. Look what's happened to the 11, especially. There's been some, uh, an unfortunate splice mid-frame, and then it's been flipped at some point. Well, here we are in a night with a night to remember, also Columbia, and there's that telltale 11 again. So I think something interesting is going on there. Uh, this is the website. That's why it's called Lost Leaders. And in closing, if I may, um, I'd like to show you um, another short, playful film. Um, it's two minutes long. Um, it's a piece of direct or cameraless animation. It's handwritten text. It's handwritten by me. I make no pretensions to being a hand-lettering artist or expert, so it's a bit of a mess. Uh, but it's also an homage to the kinds of things I've found in the archives in terms of the hand, uh, handwriting that I've found on those leaders. So I decided as a way, and this, took, this has taken about four years to make, I decided another way to familiarize myself with film leaders was I would take the standards and I would redraw them frame by frame, the leaders, the countdowns, frame by frame. So everything I could find on those standards, 
I would find a 35 mil print, I would put 35 mil clear leader over the top on a light box, and I would redraw it frame by frame. And then what I decided I would do was, if I've got the head leader and the tail leader for the Academy standard, why not then make the film between that, I would write out the complete standard by hand on 35 mil blank leader, and that would be my Academy film. And then I'd do a society film, where I would hand trace the society leader header. I would then write out the entire standard. Then I would draw trace the end. You see where this is going? So I've got three short films for you. I'd love for the sound to be higher, please. That would be awesome. Because again, there's a beautiful soundtrack for the three films by the very talented Jackie Gallant. So this is it. This is me, three short handwritten films. Thank you.